Hello and welcome to what promises to be a truly engaging session about the ongoing global push for gender equality and of course the fact that next year Mexico will be holding a summit celebrating the 25th anniversary of the Beijing Platform for Change and whether in fact we'll be talking about it if this event can indeed become an agent for change. Now, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Annette Young. I, as you can probably tell from my accent, I'm originally from Australia, but I'm also a news presenter with France 24, but most importantly, and very proudly, I'm the host and creator of The 51%, a show about women reshaping our world. That's the plug for me, now let me continue. Now, for many, the most memorable moment of that Beijing summit 25 years ago was the statement, human rights are women's rights, and women's rights are human rights. That, of course, being said by the then American First Lady, Hillary Clinton. 25 years on, and oh, how the world has changed, or in some cases, not. I mean, certainly what we are witnessing, which we did not have in 1995, is a digital revolution. We're also dealing with a ever worsening impact of climate change. In fact, some may see that America has yet to have a female president, or indeed France, um, as a sign of failure, not to mention ongoing problems with equal pay in almost every country, continuing high levels of gender-based violence. And here in France, the minister next to me, of course, very much involved with a national consultation to deal with the issue and how to end domestic abuse. I mean, that horrific statistic here in France, one of the world's wealthiest nations, a woman being murdered every three days by either her partner or former partner. There's also the ongoing ish, a battle for reproductive rights, which is happening in many parts of the world. And I'm sad to say not met any country at this point in time can safely stand up proudly and say that they have indeed truly achieved gender equality. But what we have witnessed in the last few years is a massive social shift, that being the emergence of Me Too. And the fact that more than ever, this is compounded by the fact, more than ever, we have more women in universities, in the workplace, earning money, and that means that there are a growing number of women who have the power and are now using their voice. Now, just a quick run through through the session. After introducing the panellists, there will be a Q&A session between myself and the panel, and then we'll be opening it up to you, the audience. I'm delighted to say I have a wonderful team of panellists with me today, starting off with Marlene Schepper, the French Minister for Equality and the Fight Against Discrimination. From uh, Mexico, we have uh, Marta Delgado, the Mexican Vice Minister for Multilateral Affairs and Human Rights. We also have Anita Batia, the Assistant Secretary General and Deca Deca Deputy rather, Executive uh, Director of UN Women. From the private sector, and this is very important because corporate sector plays a very big part in uh, empowering women, is Alexandra Polt, the Chief Corporate Responsibility Officer and Executive Vice President of the Fondation Group L'Oréal. And finally, we have Mildred Zhao, the youth expert from the AUEU Youth Cooperation Hub in Kenya. Please give them a, round, a warm round of applause for being here. I'm going to start by asking a question which I'm going to ask all of the panellists to answer. In a world dominated by climate change, the rise of authoritarian leadership, the economic chaos and the related unrest in various parts of the globe, against that backdrop, and not to mention, as I said, we now have a digital revolution too, how far have we actually come since that Beijing meeting? Minister. D'abord, bonjour à toutes et à tous. Je suis très heureuse de partager ce panel au Forum de Paris, au Forum pour la Paix de Paris, avec vous toutes et vous tous. Et merci d'être venues si nombreuses et si nombreux pour échanger avec nous sur ces sujets d'importance. Je dirais que nous sommes dans une période de transition, vous l'avez mentionné, à la fois de transition écologique, mais aussi de transition digitale, et j'ajouterais peut-être de transition féministe. 
au moment de la plateforme de Pékin, il y a 25 ans, on en était encore au constat et aux prémices de la lutte mondiale pour les droits des femmes. Et je crois que nous sommes maintenant à une période de transition où les constats des inégalités entre les femmes et les hommes sont pleinement partagés, où les objectifs me semblent également partagés euh, partout euh, dans le monde, de manière majoritaire, mais où nous avons encore un énorme travail pour passer du droit formel au droit réel. Et la France y est employée avec la présidence française du G7 et le partenariat de Biarritz, porté par le président de la République Emmanuel Macron, qui a proposé à tous les pays du monde de s'engager à implémenter une nouvelle loi pour l'égalité entre les femmes et les hommes sur la base d'un travail mené par le conseil consultatif du G7 dont Alexandra Palt était membre et nous allons poursuivre ce travail puisque en avril à Mexico et en juillet à Paris sous l'égide d'ONU Femmes se tiendra la célébration des 25 ans de Pékin qui va nous permettre de construire une nouvelle génération pour l'égalité entre les femmes et les hommes. Et je suis très enthousiaste à l'idée que la nouvelle génération prenne part pleinement à cette conversation que nous allons mener tous ensemble. Minister, Vice Minister. Annette, you mentioned uh, the climate change phenomena and uh, the feminist movement started very, very far away before the climate change phenomenon. And these figures are uh, just showing what uh, the, the, pay, the pace of this change is very slow. To close the global gender uh, gap will take 108 years. It will take 140 years to achieve gender parity and more than 200 years to get equal pay for equal work around the world. So uh, this is going to be a very great opportunity, this forum that uh, will start in Mexico and then will finish here in Paris in order to uh, uh, backlash the uh, uh, all this disparity against uh, the, the, the women. And what we are pursuing, both countries, is to start a really disruptive discussion in order to gain uh, better, speed up these measures and these conscience that we have to gather, all the countries around, not just from governments, but also to include civil society, the, the mass media, the private sector, the academia, the youth, and everybody in order to move forward the, the equality of uh, men and women. Anita. Uh, so thank you for the question. And uh, I think I would like the minister just to give you some data so we can decide for ourselves, has the world really progressed? And I think the answer is yes, of course, there's been progress since Beijing. As uh, Marlene Schiappa said, we have actually seen a willingness in some countries to move forward. But have we seen enough willingness to make real substantive change? And I think the answer is absolutely not. We still have 12 million girls being married off before the age of 18 worldwide. We have 130 million girls who don't go to school. We have a representation in parliament of less than 25% when it comes to women. Only less than 6% of countries in the world have heads of state or heads of government who are women. Women do not have equal access to resources. So whatever indicator you look at, there isn't a single indicator where we can take satisfaction and say, you know what, we've achieved gender equality. There are good things, however. 25 years ago, you didn't have the private sector talking about gender equality. You do today. But the other thing that is happening today, which is really complex and sort of contradictory, is that at the same time as you have Me Too and Time's Up, which is lulling people into this false sense of complacency that there's real movement, you actually have the rise in many countries of illiberal democracies that are crushing dissent, that are crushing women's voices. And as a result, we actually have to run to stay in place, particularly with respect to sexual and reproductive rights. And indeed, we'll be talking about that later, about that angry pushback that we're now witnessing in various parts of the globe. Alexandra, I mean, obviously, you're going to talk about it from a corporate perspective, about where we are 25 years on. But just the last few days, I was reading that uh, Apple, which has set up a credit card system, its algorithms, as a result, apparently gave male applicants far greater levels of credit 
than women. That just goes to show how insidious gender disparity still exists in all levels of corporate culture, doesn't it? Yeah, well, I, I would say not just in corporate culture, but everywhere. I very much agree uh, with uh, what was just said. So I think what is important to say, yes, we cannot just say nothing has been done because this is not going to encourage uh, the future generation and ourselves to continue the fight. I think there has, progress has been there. What uh, I fully agree with what you said, but I see not, of course, in the corporate world, international big corporations, there is so much scrutiny scrutiny on what we are doing, that uh, everybody is uh, working on that issue. I would like to add a perspective, which is more coming from my work with the L'Oreal Foundation, on women in science. And uh, because I think uh, the issue of women in science is central to the future of our societies, especially when we look to climate change and the digital uh, transformation. And so what you just said is perhaps on uh, Apple is less uh, connected to Apple's culture than to the culture of digital, of STEM, of the absence of women. And so I think when we look in issues like, gen uh, like climate change and gender, what we know today is we still have not the right data on the impacts of climate change that are disproportionately impacting women in different ways than men, we still have not the information, the right data available and the right studies available. We have studies available in some parts of the world where we know that women are up to 70% more victims in national and natural catastrophes. We know that women fetch the water and the wood uh, and climate change is going to impact their daily contribution um, to household activities unfortunately not allowing girls to go to school. So we know that there are going hundreds of impacts, particularly on women's lives, which are not enough studied, where we have not enough data. And we know at the same time that when we look into the digital transformation, that 11% of women have uh, positions, senior leadership positions in artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence and robotics are going to be the factor that is going to make all our lives up uh, tomorrow. So how, how are we going just to live with robots that are programmed by men, uh, scientists? We are just looking into a world and to a non-inclusive society. And I think this is very preoccupying. Mildred, I'm not sure if you were actually alive in 1995. Um, if you were, I suspect you were quite young at that time in any case. But for someone like you looking ahead to next year, what are you hoping that this summit is going to achieve? Thank you, Annette. Um, I think first for starters, let me start by saying that um, the last 25 years, somebody thought out the space for women and actually considered that we need an equal society. And looking back, I think I would say I would be grateful for those young, for those women who did that at the time, because if it wasn't for them, I wouldn't be here today. Because you know, you're young and you have to wait your turn. But looking forward, I think I, I find a space where, as young women, we have a space to contribute, and we need a space where we need to actually be allowed to contribute um, through our minds, through our spaces. And looking forward, there's also so much space, and we need to acknowledge um, what has been done so far. We have more uh, positive transformation in terms of culture, in terms of um, more receptive cultures, more receptive uh, men who are equal, uh, interested in having um, spaces for both men and women. We cannot definitely um, look past the he for she movement where men are actually speaking against toxic masculinity and that allows young women like me and many other in this room spaces to actually be able to stand up. Um, looking forward to the uh, generation equality movement in 2020, I'm hoping that we can find a space to actually think about new kinds of problems that women face for the new generation. We need to look at the rates of femicide. And I'm surprised to hear the, the statistics in France about one in three women being murdered by a partner or a lover. One every three days. That's insane. And you know, this has taken a new form in the digital era. You're looking at things like cyberbullying and you know, a harassment of women online being not able to even take up that particular space. So I think we need to look about, think about what new problems are we facing and how are we adapting to actually resolve those problems. 
Thank you for bringing up that point about France because, as I just said earlier, later this month, the French government's going to release the results of that national consultation on dealing with gender abuse. Um, Minister, as you and I know, the French government has clearly made gender equality a priority, but it's a very broad issue. In the last couple of years, what do you believe that the government has managed to achieve and what still needs to be done and what certainly is the number one priority? D'abord, je pense qu'il restera toujours des choses à faire euh, tant qu'il y aura euh, des femmes, même en quantité euh, faible ou infime, qui souffriront des inégalités euh, entre les femmes et les hommes. Je pense que ce que nous avons pu euh, réussir, commencer à réussir à faire, d'abord, c'est le fait que le président de la République ait déclaré l'égalité entre les femmes et les hommes, grande cause de son quinquennat en France, et qu'ensuite, à l'Assemblée générale des Nations unies, l'année dernière, il ait appelé tous les États à faire de l'égalité femmes-hommes une grande cause mondiale. Et c'est ce qui se manifeste dans la diplomatie féministe de la France, à la fois dans les actions que nous pouvons mener avec l'ONU et avec ONU Femmes, dans ce que nous avons mené dans le cadre de la présidence du G7, mais aussi financièrement. Nous sommes le premier pays à avoir soutenu le fonds Mukwege, créé par le coprix Nobel de la paix à Denis Mukwege et par Nadia Mourad, pour soutenir les femmes victimes de violences de guerre à hauteur de 6 millions d'euros. Et nous avons soutenu également l'initiative AFAWA de la Banque africaine de développement pour soutenir l'entrepreneuriat des femmes en Afrique. Mais au-delà de cette diplomatie féministe, la France mène un travail également, ne serait-ce que pour partager ce constat. Nous nous demandions avec Alexandra Palt en arrivant qui étaient les gens qui étaient dans, dans cette salle. Et nous partageons, je me permets de le dire, Alexandra, le, le constat que très souvent, lorsque nous faisons des conférences, des interventions sur l'égalité femmes-hommes, les gens qui sont dans la salle sont des gens qui eux-mêmes sont engagés. Je pense que personne dans cette salle ne pense qu'on parle trop souvent d'égalité femmes-hommes. Pourtant, ce sont des choses qu'on entend encore dans des réunions sérieuses avec des gens qui ont du pouvoir. Je pense que personne dans cette salle ne se dit « Oh, l'égalité salariale, ça va, ça va arriver tout seul ». Oui, ça va arriver tout seul en l'an 2234, d'après le World Economic Forum. Mais à l'extérieur de cette salle et à l'extérieur de nos organisations respectives, il y a énormément de gens qui considèrent que ça va, euh, les femmes, qu'est-ce qu'elles veulent encore Déjà qu'elles peuvent voter et qu'elles ont droit, dans certains endroits, d'avoir accès à la contraception. En plus, elles veulent du pouvoir. Il y a des gens qui considèrent qu'on euh, parle trop des violences sexuelles et qu'il faudrait quand même protéger ces pauvres hommes qui ne savent pas comment se positionner quand ils sont accusés de violences sexuelles alors qu'ils voulaient juste être un peu lourds. Donc je crois qu'en fait, le discours féministe n'est pas le discours dominant, ni en France, ni d'ailleurs partout dans le monde. Et on parlait tout à l'heure euh, du backlash et du pushback. Et effectivement, je crois qu'il est très fort et qu'il n'y a pas seulement un pushback, mais il y a aussi une majorité euh, de personnes dans le monde qui ne sont pas pour l'égalité entre les femmes et les hommes, qui font peut-être euh, moins de bruit, qui organisent moins de conférences, qui prennent moins la parole, mais qui ont cette idéologie anti-féministe, sous-jacente, et que nous devons combattre. Donc je dirais que nous avons commencé à essayer de partager ce constat et de dire que l'égalité femmes-hommes doit être l'affaire de toute la société, pas d'un gouvernement, pas d'association, pas des ONG, de toute la société. Mais je crois que nous aurons vraiment changé les choses quand toute la société partagera ce constat et voudra s'engager pour changer les choses avec nous. Yes, it's talking about rewiring deep-seated cultural mindsets and biases. Um, Martha de Galdo, a couple of years ago, the 51% and its fifth French sister show, Actuelle, went to Argentina and did a special on femicide. Gender-based violence is a massive problem in your country with UN agencies estimating that six out of 10 women are affected. Latin America, of course, being home to 14 out of the most 25 dangerous countries in the world for women. I would just like to ask you, are Latin American nations capable of coming together and working to address this issue given the culture of machismo which really does exist in your part of the world, doesn't it? Well, this is a uh, very interesting question because uh, Latin American countries, we have always defended uh, the women and at the international fora. And there is a big challenge for a country, country as ours to close the gap between these uh, international aspirations that we are defending in a multilateral level Uh, uh, to, to down these aspirations to our reality at the, at the very uh, local level. 
The, uh, in Mexico, we have, uh, of course, uh, high levels of violence against women. But at the same time, for example, we have a now more uh, Congress women. We have more um, women uh, at the uh, cabinet of the president. We have a, a lot of uh, leaders that are women right now. So this, this gap is going to be closed as much as we gain more cultural change that it is needed and a really, really basic uh, way in order for men to respect women and also in a country as Mexico to uh, establish a real uh, rule of law because the impunity and the lack of justice is one of the main factors that are uh, right now driven uh, the uh, inequality uh, between men and women. Anita, um, the UN Women obviously being very much in charge of next year's event with obviously help from the French and the Mexican governments. Why did the UN consider it necessary to organise such an event next year? Well, first let me thank our partners, Mexico and France, because this really is a collaborative effort with them and with civil society. And I really want to acknowledge the leadership from uh, both governments uh, on this issue. Um, look, we are uh, facing a new normal in the world today. And uh, while government public policy is really important, um, we need all actors to take part in getting rid of gender equality. So basically, the reason that we are working with France and Mexico and civil society to catalyze this movement is because we need all stakeholders. Civil society, the private sector, young people, governments, we need everyone to come to the table. There is such a hunger in the world today. You see it in social movements everywhere and governments toppling and you know people going out on the streets today. There is such a hunger for more just, equitable and inclusive societies. And we cannot build these societies with 50% of the population left out. And we want to respond to catalyze this movement. We want to celebrate, as has been said earlier, 25 years of Beijing, but we also want to create an aspiration for urgent change. So one of the things we want to do next year is actually use the Beijing platform celebration to create very specific action coalitions around specific themes that can help accelerate ambition in a few key areas and basically build a business plan for the world around gender equality. Alexandra, as somebody who represents the corporate world, um, when you listen to what Anita is saying, um, there are clearly key issues that need to be addressed. I mean, certainly the business, as we, you pointed out and others have pointed out in the last 25 years, has taken a, strong, a stronger role uh, in promoting women's empowerment, but it's not doing enough, is it? Yeah, nobody's doing enough. So we, we can all agree on that. Um, I, I think uh, change uh, in society you know, needs contribution from every part and everybody is not doing enough. So we are happy to take more part in this. I think uh, what, what I would like to point out, and you might say that I'm a little bit obsessed with the women scientists, and I am, um, because I think the world challenges need informed decision making. I think that climate change, that uh, digital transformation, that all the challenges we face and we will face in the upcoming years, we are, we are in, a, in, a, in a transformation that has never occurred. We have destroyed our safe operating space as humankind. So this is an enormous challenge. And to respond to that challenge, we will need research. We will need research for informed political decision, for informed corporate decision. And if we need research and scientists, we need both genders represented. And today they are are not. They are clearly not. On the women scientists part in, re in leadership positions, we have in 20 years, the number have evolved from 24 to 28 percent. So only uh, in a world average around 30 percent of researchers are women. Um, scientific decision today is gender-based and that has consequences. That has consequences in the fight against climate change, in adaptation, in mitigation. It has consequences on uh, um, other fields such as 
as artificial intelligence we have talked about. So if we want to have informed political decision, which is not today, unfortunately, always and everywhere the norm, um, we need scientists and we need women scientists and women participating in political decision making. Mildred, um, as Alexandra was talking there about two revolutions that are taking place. One is the digital revolution, the other is the gender revolution. And one area of the world where young women have been benefiting enormously from mobile technology is Africa. Uh, as a result, what would you say are their aspirations and what can we do in order to make sure that what happens next year at that forum in Mexico City truly resonate with them? Um, okay, so for starters, I'm going to bring it down um, just to the level of the people on the ground. It's great that we're going to have the forum next year and we're going to build a business plan for agenda globally. But if we really want to see the change is now how we really break down that business plan and make it work. And I'm going to say one thing. Naming is norming and language is very important in how we really um, catalyze the gender uh, equality fight. Um, the role of young people is very critical, but also the role of the people in leadership, the role of the media. How do we address the gender equality issues? How do we portray it? Because that's what becomes our new normal. When we look at um, you know, like areas in Africa where things are starting to change in terms of also the inclusion of young women, of course, we're very, very far from it, um, but what is the things that we grow up seeing? I'm going to grow up and I'm going to see that a, a, a woman can become a minister, a woman can, be, can, can become a, a member of parliament, and I'll know that it's possible. How I see it within my community and the things that they say in, in terms of affirmation towards women will also build how I take that gender movement and believe in what is possible. So I think um, the aspirations of young people and young women, both men and women for 2020, is that we can create a new normal because we are all hardwired in terms of how we are socialized. And the minute we begin to just um, break that down, break down the stereotypes that we have built in our minds by creating a new normal, then we will be moving forward in terms of implementing the grand business plan. At this point, given that we've talked there about, <clears throat> or rather Anita has suggested creating a roadmap or a business plan or whatever you want to call it, I want to talk to the two ministers here who are going to be very much involved with next year's event. Uh, Marlene, starting with yourself, what are you hoping the forum will achieve? D'abord, j'espère qu'il y aura une véritable mobilisation euh, l'année prochaine et on espère vous voir euh, toutes et tous à Paris en juillet 2020 euh, autour euh, du forum Génération Égalité. Et ensuite, nous sommes en train de travailler en ce moment même avec euh, ONU Femmes, avec euh, le Mexique, pour construire ces coalitions thématiques. Euh, ces coalitions, ce sont des coalitions d'États, parce que les États doivent s'engager, mais aussi euh, des, des groupements de la société civile. Et le constat que nous faisons là, c'est qu'en réalité, aucun pays dans le monde n'a atteint l'égalité entre les femmes et les hommes. Euh, Alexandra disait « personne n'en fait assez », je partage pleinement euh, ce constat. Personne nulle part. Vous n'avez aucun pays où vous ayez une parité parfaite en termes de politique, une égalité des salaires entre les femmes et les hommes, une répartition égale femmes-hommes pour les soins apportés aux enfants, pour euh, le care, pour euh, le travail euh, non payé, euh, où vous n'ayez pas de violence euh, genrée, c'est-à-dire de violence dans le couple, de violence domestique, de harcèlement de rue, de violence sexiste et sexuelle. Ce pays n'existe pas. Il y a des pays qui sont modèles dans tel ou tel sujet, sur tel ou tel thème, mais vous n'avez aucun pays dans lequel être une femme vous apporte les mêmes choses que d'être un homme. C'est une inégalité de destin mondial. Quel que soit le pays du monde dans lequel vous naissez fille, vous naissez avec moins de chance que si vous naissez garçon. Alors dans le pire des cas, ce sera dans un pays en guerre dans lequel vous risquez d'être excisé, mutilé, marié de force à un jeune âge, peut-être réduite à l'esclavage sexuel ou tué euh, clairement. Dans le entre guillemets meilleur des cas, dans un pays euh, développé euh, occidental, entre guillemets riche, appartenant au G7 tel que la France, vous ne serez pas mutilé, quoi qu'il y a 60 000 femmes qui vivent excisées en France, mais sur le sol français, c'est interdit. En revanche, vous serez moins payé juste parce que vous êtes une femme. Vous aurez moins de chances de vous insérer dans la vie politique juste parce que vous êtes une femme. Quand vous ouvrirez un compte Twitter, vous serez probablement cyberharcelé et menacé 
juste parce que vous êtes une femme. Dans la rue, dans le métro, il faudra choisir avec prudence l'endroit où vous vous asseyez juste parce que vous êtes une femme et vous aurez moins de probabilités de vous orienter vers les sciences ou vers les filières technologiques et les métiers de demain juste parce que vous êtes une femme. Et cette inégalité de destin, on peut y mettre fin tous ensemble, tous les pays ensemble, mais toutes les organisations ensemble et tous les citoyens ensemble. C'est le grand rendez-vous que nous nous donnons tout ensemble, mutuellement, en 2020 avec Génération Égalité. Marta, how do you make sure that what comes out of that forum also reflects the needs of women in the global south? Because a common criticism we often face with such gatherings is that they're dominated by women's groups, women's activists from developed nations. Well, right now, I think that we do need to rekindle the uh, promotion of women's rights worldwide because, uh, for example, at the multilateral level, not just for the Global South, but also for developed countries, the words women, equity, rights, right now at the UN negotiations, for example, uh, we have been uh, backwards on that wording and that defense. So what we need to do, uh, starting in Mexico and ending here in Paris, is to study a, again a global public conversation regarding those rights and also to engage much more the, uh, the stakeholders needed to make this uh, forum a good space to open these discussions and also to get and to reach the uh, assembly on September with a very good declaration. Because we started back on 1975 in the very same place that we're gonna organize the uh, uh, Gender Equality Forum uh, next year in 2020. In that place, we started discussing that. And now uh, a lot of things have changed. For example, in this time we are going to broadcast live the event and we, we want to engage the, all the community of the Global South, maybe not just personally, but also uh, by uh, internet and other ways of communication. But what we have to do right now is to um, uh, strengthen the international governance to uh, insist on the uh, women's rights as legitimate and uh, proper for this 21st century that we have passed uh, 20 years after 25 years after the Beijing platform and we have uh, not just uh, not advanced at all but we have a lot of work to do in front of us. We are witnessing a very angry pushback. In fact, if there was a commonality between white supremacists and Islamic jihadists and you sat them down in one room, the one thing they would agree on is their hatred of women. Against this pushback, how do we galvanise getting governments, corporate sector, in fact everybody, on board to support a forum of this na nature and to understand it is absolutely fundamentally important given we're 20 years into the 21st century. Well, first, to solve a problem, you first have to recognize that there is a problem. And so I wanna go back to what I said earlier about uh, really being clear on the status of women in the world today and recognizing that there is this pushback because there are a lot of people uh, who will tell you that the world has advanced but they are not taking account of the complexity of the current situation where as i said before we have to run to stay in place you know as a student of history i find it very strange that we are talking about things that we had actually we thought we could take for granted there were certain rights that we thought we don't actually have to discuss anymore, and now we can move on to all the unfinished business. But we never envisaged that our unfinished business would include things that we thought had been taken care of. So I think this is really important. The other thing that is really important is that gender equality is complex. When you look at climate change, you can get the world to coalesce around a number. You can coalesce around 1.5, right? When you talk about gender equality, there are so many different facets that it's hard to get the world to coalesce. So how do we do it? So the how are these action coalitions to be actually meaningful and substantive they have to be focused so we can't address everything. So we'll, we'll probably have between five and six action coalitions. Two, they will be inclusive. They have to include 
member states, civil society, and business, and the voice of youth, so that they are reflecting everybody's voices. Number three, they have to come with money. Money talks. One of the big things about Beijing is that it was not costed. There were no resources put to these aspirations. And when you look at financing for gender equality worldwide, I think we can all agree that governments are simply not spending enough to push gender equality forward. You said it nicely. Not in, nobody is doing enough. So one of the things we want to do with action coalitions is have numbers attached to the actions. And then we're going to ask those who want to join these action uh, coalitions to make very specific commitments that we can monitor and report back on to the world every, every year for at least the next five years. So I think they have to be time bound, they have to be costed, they have to be practical, and they have to be exciting and aspirational so we get a lot of people wanting to join them. Alexandra, um, when you talk to people in business, and particularly here in France, you mentioned the word quotas and their faces go white, um, more so than in other countries. There is something to be said though you can call it quotas, you can call it targets, but when you have 30% of women leading a company, the culture changes, 30% being the tipping point. I'm just curious to know from your corporate perspective, when you hear about what's going to happen next year, what would you hope the corporate world takes from an event like that? Um, so I, I don't know if you're very interested in my personal aspect, perspective on quotas, but I'm in favour of quotas because, of course, it's very easy. Um, we have put quotas on board members, uh, female board members, and what we see is now that everywhere we have achieved uh, the number almost, uh, the obligatory numbers, which shows uh, that it's not an issue about not having the competences available, but not proactively looking for women who can do the job. So it's very clear. So what, as a, as a corporate um, representative, what I hope is um, I have to disagree on one only small point with you, which is that if we have the 1.5 degree, people can move. Yeah, nobody moves. So um, unfortunately, we are heading to a four degree scenario and not at all at a 1.5 climate change scenario, which shows that there is something more than just, um, at one point there has to come political will. Political will comes to pressure from civil society. And the pressure from civil society will also, I hope, finally come because we understand that inclusive societies function better, have better economies. Everything is better in a society where women have equal rights for everybody. And I think we did not make this um, clear enough to everybody, or I, I don't know how we can do it and how we can make it clear, but a society that's working is a society where we have gender equality. Yes, yeah, sure. Because I don't think, but society is also richer when women are included. Right. But so you only have to look at the gender pay gap and, and look at the countries that are come up on the top and the economies that are flourishing the most are those that have the narrowest gender pay gap. That's true too, and, but I was just thinking of a study I just read which the IMF just published on unpaid work. And basically it says that if you were to close the gap on unpaid work, most countries' GDP would actually go up by four points. And you know, women do, on average, two hours more of unpaid work than men do. So just a simple thing like that can address, um, can actually make a difference in the size of the economy. So imagine what benefits there would be to economies if we were to address other issues around gender equality. So you can actually grow the pie for everyone. And uh, I do remember an interview I did with Matt Winkler, the editor-in-chief of Bloomberg, uh, a, a news organisation some of you may be familiar with, who were the first news outlet to roll out a women's policy. And I asked him why, and he said three words, diversity means business. Mildred, we just have time for a last question before we open it up to the audience. But it is important that it ends up with you, because you are the future. I would just want to know what of those Beijing action points and speaking with a new voice, how can we now make them reflective of the new generation of young women coming up? And how can we make it so that they too feel that their concerns are being addressed? 
Um, I think the most important thing is giving young people space. And a lot of times people ask, what does that even mean? Um, I think the first thing is being able to co-design and really influence and inject their voice in the solutions that come through. And I'll give an example. I'm, an ex I'm a member of the AU EU Youth Cooperation Hub. And it's all about providing and piloting solutions through young people and giving them the space to actually design them. So um, when you're trying to get a new generation push for young women, it's really important that we don't make decisions up there and then come and say, you know, this is great, so this is how we're gonna go about it. I think if we do this, we'll definitely include you as young people. Let it come from the ground up. Let us have those consultations from the very beginning, as opposed to doing it the opposite, uh, where you start with making the suggestions and then having young people validate and accept that. Let us include them from the beginning in terms of what are the pain points, what issues do you face? Because you will be surprised that some of the issues that will come up are not um, issues that a new an older generation of young women would actually um, put forward things like um, you know cyber crime and and you know violence through social media is not something that I with all due respect uh, maybe some 40 old year old woman would be facing but it's something that is so important to a young woman of 12 13 15 and at that point it actually makes all the difference in their lives so having the system where we can actually consult listen include them that's going to be really important and that's going to make all the difference in how we push forward and um, implement this. The other thing I'm going to say, and I'm just going to support Anita on this, is um, financing the gender equality push. It's one thing to say fantastic things on paper, but having it implemented on the ground, it means we have to put our money where the mouth, our mouths are. And we have to have the willingness to actually be able to implement that. And if we do that, we'll be able to monitor and track the progress that we're making and be able to make adjustments so that we can have a better future that is more balanced. Mildred, thank you very much for that. And as you say, don't just talk the talk, but walk the walk as well. At this point, I'd like to invite members of the audience to ask questions. I would ask that when you do ask a question, please, uh, first of all, put your hand up. Also say... Uh, your name and which organisation, and please make it a question and not a statement. Thank you. Hello, I'm in Versailles. I'm preparing with uh, New York the United Nations Alliance of Civilization program. For 15 years, it started, and uh, there are all in, uh, the countries in the world are invited to in this uh, World Think Tank of uh, Interfaith issue. They are invited to create their own. Uh, academic research center. But France, for 15 years, refused to make this effort. Um, it's not the case of UK and US. And it's important to, uh, to make a, a bridge between all, all civilizations to avoid wars. And the, the veil uh, in France, we have a lot of uh, young ladies, uh, young, uh, young girls who are very good people to become scientific. Um, but they are excluded of, uh, of the schools because they have uh, a veil on, uh, on their, uh, on their uh, face, Madam, on their hair. Can I just ask, so your question is directed to who and what is exactly your question? So for, um, for, uh, to, because we are in late in France, uh, we need, uh, uh, I need for my office in Versailles uh, a support to, to join this uh, world network of Alliance of Civilizations. So if uh, some people want to, to develop uh, this network is New York, United Alliance of Civilization. And the second thing, uh, the, the young girl in school mustn't leave school in France uh, as they are very good people because they could become a very good scientific uh, in the future only because of their faith and their veil. So we have to be very careful in France not to exclude, to unpatch our young girl to become scientific. Thank okay. you. Okay, uh, at this point I think there was a bit of a question there for you, Minister, if you'd like to ask, oui. it's a very contentious issue. Bien sûr, très brièvement, merci pour votre question. Je ne partage pas, évidemment, madame, votre constat. Il y a une loi en France qui est 
qui défend la laïcité, c'est-à-dire la séparation entre les églises et l'État. Je comprends que cette loi soit parfois difficilement intelligible euh, vue de l'extérieur, mais cette loi prévoit une neutralité, ce qui protège justement euh, les, les, les élèves et leur permet de venir à l'école en étant protégés euh, de toute religion et en étant considérés comme des élèves à part entière et non pas comme des élèves appartenant ou n'appartenant pas à telle ou telle religion. Et je ne crois pas que ça empêche qui que ce soit de devenir scientifique. Les élèves enfants peuvent venir à l'école, quelle que soit bien sûr leur religion, sans un voile. Et ensuite, quand elles font des études supérieures, peuvent venir suivre des études supérieures avec un voile. Le voile à l'université n'est pas interdit parce que nous considérons que ça protège la liberté de conscience des enfants, mais qu'une fois adulte, chacun peut faire ses choix. Et au titre de la même manière de la liberté de conscience, peut venir voiler si elle le souhaite à l'université. C'est la même raison pour laquelle il est interdit de venir avec un signe religieux à l'école lorsqu'on est mineur. OK. Uh, yes, the lady behind. Lady behind, yes. Um, would you like to stand up, say your name and which organisation you're with and who you would like to direct the, your question to? Hello, my name is Galia Melendez. I come from the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights. And my question is for the two ministers. So I was waiting actually for the momentum of the sexual and reproductive rights. We didn't come back. But I think now in Latin America is raising a huge moment, a feminist moment for sexual and reproductive rights. So I was wondering if this is actually the momentum of both governments taking position of what is the position of sexual and reproductive rights. And secondly, is this forum will be 100% inclusive of all the Americas, not only one percentage of the, of the population, but also like indigenous people, um, like the whole picture and a scenario. Thank you so much. I think a minister from Mexico, would you like to answer that? Well, the Mexican government, the current one, is a very progressist government and is defending not just inside but also at the international level the sexual and reproductive rights. Unfortunately, this is a matter that is uh, stuck in the at the international negotiations and Mexico will always be active on defending these rights uh, as uh, much as Mexico is also uh, own owner of a 68 different indigenous towns people um, we are going to invite and to include as much as we can the indigenous population of our country and others. But uh, this is uh, very challenging for us to, to ask of all of them to come. And uh, I, I will say that uh, we will privilege the presence of uh, indigenous women and the, at the forum uh, from Latin America and I hope also from other continents. Yes, the lady there. Hi, Dina Berakat. And I think my question is to Alexandra, and specifically you mentioned about quotas and how um, we support them. I agree it's a good step in the right direction, but how do you feel about the fact that at the boardroom we may have attained a level of equality, but that does not necessarily trickle down the corporate ladder? And you mentioned the necessity of informed decision and research and I think the second is a two-pronged question to anyone at the panel is, you're all ahead of us in the game. What is being done so that that research is actually, includes intersectionalities of women? Because a, a lot of the research I've studied or I've looked at is beneficial for you know white women to make it there. But when it comes to intersections, albeit, like sexuality or skin color, it's, it's very different. So. Alexandra. So, um, so I think um, everywhere in the world, if I start with the second question, everywhere in the world we are late on intersectionality. It's very clear that women who suffer from uh, double or triple discrimination are still completely neglected in research and even in action. So I will not at all defend any state of art on this, and uh, I, I, I completely agree with you. Um, I think that uh, we are particularly late in France, I have to say, compared to Anglo-Saxon uh, countries, I have the impression. But uh, because um, we would like um, 
in France, we have, have this idea of uh, legality uh, uh, that is part uh, that is in the constitution, which is sufficient to declare when we are equal, we have equal rights, which we are, of course, all aware that is not the case. So there is still enormous work to be done, and I think also at the corporate level, that the, uh, a, a woman, a woman uh, from a minority background in leadership position is still the exception you know, and not at all a normal thing. So I completely recognize that. I think that's true for society everywhere. Uh, so I do very, m I'm very much in favor of positive action or, you know, quota for a very simple reason, you know, if at one point we have, we have discussed this now for how many years? 50, 60 uh, years, and we see this is not a natural movement making place uh, and space for women in leadership position, that, that's, that's a tough, and it's understandable, you know, because why should the guy who is just coming up uh, in, the, in the letter of hierarchy leave his, space, his place to, uh, to me? And I completely, uh, completely stand up for um, a voluntary action even if then there are some people who say, yeah, but she is just there because uh, of the quota, well, we, have, we can all make our proof points afterwards, I don't care. Um, so if people want to say that, I'm fine with that because I've proved that I know what I'm doing afterwards. So I think we all have also to, as women, be courageous and say, yes, uh, I, I do think this is necessary to make space because it's not a voluntary movement. And so I'm very, very much defending this idea. And it's certainly something that I see with older women there who sometimes are accused of what we call a trapdoor mentality, where they get to a high-level position, but they firmly close the door behind for younger women. It's for everybody to be on board. And may I point out, it is sad we are all women here because we didn't talk about, obviously, the need for men to be part of this whole movement too. We have time for just one last question. I see somebody there. Yes. Yeah. Hi. Hi, I'm Joanna Cahilato. I'm from the European Commission and I'm focusing on women's economic empowerment in our international cooperation. And I have a question for uh, France, Mexico and UN women. A uh, quite practical question on, on the generation equality. Um, so could you just explain a bit more what, what can we do to be part of this action coalition? So what kind of initiatives you are looking for? Um, and then the second question is, uh, what's the relationship between, between the first event in uh, the forum in Mexico and then the one in, for, uh, in Paris? And also what can countries and organizations to do to be part of these forums? I think, Anita, you probably would want to start. Okay. Um, well, look, we do want this to be an inclusive event, so we really welcome the idea of you or the Commission participating, and we are reaching out. But please join the youth uh, movements that are already part of this through civil society, and happy to give you details afterwards. Uh, with respect to Mexico and um, France, we see these as, uh, you know, Mexico is the first place, and as the Minister said, you know, Mexico has a very proud tradition of being uh, involved in the women's movement. So we want to recognize and celebrate that. And for the action coalitions, it becomes the place to test uh, the blueprints for the action coalitions to get feedback from multiple stakeholders and then to take that to Paris where people can actually make those firm commitments, sign up for them and declare to the world their commitment to advancing gender equality. So very connected events, can't have one party without the other. The two ministers, would either of you like to comment in response to that question? Je pense qu'Anita a très bien euh, décrit les différences et, et les implications dans la coalition. Moi, je voudrais simplement rebondir, euh, si vous me le permettez, sur la question des quotas qui a été euh, évoquée tout à l'heure et simplement euh, rappeler que, en fait, c'est une question qu'on se pose régulièrement de savoir si on peut être pour ou contre euh, les quotas de femmes. Mais je crois que si on est contre les quotas de femmes, en fait, on est contre la place des femmes parce que les hommes ont été nommés pendant des générations parce qu'ils étaient des hommes. Et eh ben c'est pas grave, pendant quelques générations, on va nommer des femmes parce qu'elles sont des femmes. Et parfois, on nous dit, ça va être offensant pour une femme d'être nommée sur un quota. Non, ce qui est offensant pour une femme, c'est de ne pas être nommée. On préfère être nommée sur un quota que de ne pas être nommée. Et je voulais répondre à l'interpellation qui nous était faite.
fait, sur la question des droits sexuels et reproductifs tout à l'heure, simplement dire que la France soutient très fermement et sans aucune ambiguïté l'accès euh, à la contraception et l'accès à l'IVG pour toutes les femmes partout dans le monde. Nous avons reçu euh, le réalisateur euh, de Kessé Alley, euh, qui porte ce combat en Argentine et dans certains pays euh, d'Amérique latine, et nous soutenons bien évidemment tous les mouvements de la société civile qui défendent le droit pour les femmes d'accéder à l'avortement. Ce sera un des thèmes euh, de l'une des coalitions que nous montrons pour euh, Génération Égalité. Everything has been said. <laughs> And with that, may I ask you to give a warm round of applause for my wonderful panelists. Thank you.